two. We are going to be bouncing around a little bit today, so kind of keep your Bibles up and running. In our sermon series for Christmas, <clears throat> we've looked at the light last week. We look at the Lord this week. And the final week, we look at the Lamb. Light, Lord, and Lamb. I will never forget an extremely uncomfortable conversation I had several years ago in a Sunday school class. I was teaching, we were looking at scripture <clears throat> and a mid thirties or close to 40 year old uh, African-American male brought up his strong objections and his disgust for these two words, bond servant or slave and Lord slash master. This gentleman <clears throat> argued that with the heritage his race had gone through, he viscerally, he was disgusted, nauseated with these words. He could not speak these words when he read God's word that speaks them so many times. And he could not understand how we could use these words in a Bible study in which a member was African American. So how would you handle that? Very difficult conversation. With prayer, I said, Lord, gentleness, reverence, patience. I said a couple of things. I said, first, we're studying God's word. These aren't our words. These are the words of God, as we've studied over and over, God breathes out his words to the authors of the scripture. These are God's words. So we can't ignore God's word. The second thing I said is slavery in the first century, when Jesus was talking and preaching, was rampant with slavery. Slaves were usually acquired when another nation conquered its enemy. It took most of its population as slaves. Not African-American, they were a small minority of slaves. People who got into big debt would sell their bodies into slavery. That's the word bond servant, which we're gonna be talking about a lot. And you sell your body and life to this, into a, a person's family to pay off your debt. I in no way am accommodating slavery. It is a horror. It's an abomination. And slavery still goes on. We forget that. The sex slave trade is alive and well in America. It's rampant in Asia and Africa and other areas of the world. It's rampant. So slaves still exist. But these words didn't seem to sink in. And sadly, this gentleman never returned to that Sunday school class. His <clears throat> bitterness against those words, bondservant and Lord and Master, he could not even be in a room where those words were discussed. So with that as a background, this is a difficult conversation to have, and you may have this conversation as you meet people from other races or who have these ideas that slavery and using the word slave is so terribly wrong. But let's look at verse 11. In Luke chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 11. Because we're going to see one of these words. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Savior who is Christ the Lord. Nowhere else in Scripture, nowhere, 
are these three words together. So this is an important scripture. We're going to be reading this again on New, Year, on New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, as we have our Christmas Eve candlelight communion, which is going to be a wonderful service. But these are important words. A savior is pretty straightforward. In, in the original language, it means someone who saves, like a king who saves you from your enemy. So someone who saves you from being conquered and pulled into slavery. He's your savior. And Jesus is our ultimate savior. He saves us from sin. He saves us from Satan. He saves us from death. He gives us eternal life. He is the ultimate Savior. Christ, as you remember, we've talked several times, Christ is the <clears throat> Greek word for Messiah. So Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one, literally. It means the anointed one. And that is from the son of David. That's why, don't you know, how there are no... Accidents in God's word. He was born in the city of David because he's the son of David, the anointed one, the Messiah, all of prophecy. Everything points to this. And here it is again, hammered home to us. The son of David is the Messiah. This is the baby Jesus. And then the word we're going to focus on is Lord. <clears throat> Lord literally means your master. You call your master Lord. If you watch any British shows, you see this all the time with servants. Yes, my Lord. Yes, my Lord. Okay? All the time. You call your master your Lord. And as difficult as that is to understand sometimes, that is what it literally means. However, when it comes to Jesus... Lord is a lot more than just your master. Lord, if you look in your Old Testament <clears throat> and notice this, when you look at the word Lord, it's going to be all in capital letters in a small font. Small, it's all capitalized letters, L-O-R-D. That is how the Old Testament writes the four letters of Yahweh, Lord, L-O-R-D. So when you read Lord in the Old Testament and Lord almost always when it refers to Jesus in the New Testament, it's meaning Yahweh, the great I am. Remember that. Yahweh is what that word absolutely means. And the Lord Jesus is absolutely sovereign and rules this entire universe, not just my life, your life. He rules the entire universe. And he has absolute power, absolute power that brings us salvation, forgiveness of our sins, conquering of death, eternal life with him. He has absolute power because Jesus, baby Jesus, even as a baby, is Lord Yahweh, Lord of all. When Jesus was on earth in his ministry, <clears throat> this is how you learned. They didn't have universities. They didn't have seminaries. You studied with someone. And this rabbi or teacher, you would actually live in their house. And they would have a few students, three or four students. And then every time well, they'd be walking, the students would be walking behind head bowed, and they would call them Lord, Lord. And they would be like slaves they, because you would do duties. You would, if the teacher says, hey, go clean out the toilets, they didn't have toilets, but you'd have to go clean out the toilet. Uh, go sweep up this, sweep up that. You were their servant. And that is the way it was. Now, again, this difficult <clears throat> conversation, I'm going to flip, I'm not going to flip anywhere. In my Bible, I'm looking over uh, one page. We're going to look at Luke 1, 38, because this is, in my opinion, one of the most important 
verses to help us understand this difficult concept of slaves and masters that obviously upset some people. This is <clears throat> Mary's response to the angel. And you remember, Mary's 13 or 14. She knows she's pregnant. She knows she's a virgin. She doesn't understand. The angel explains it. This is the Holy Spirit. You've been chosen by God. And what is this little teenager's response? I mean, I'd be, I mean, I'm not a girl. I don't know what it would feel like to be pregnant, but I would be freaking out. I'll just tell you that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to say. But here's what she says. And what she says, I pray I have the guts to say myself. I pray that you have the guts to say yourself when the world tempts us and pulls us away. Mary said, behold, behold, I am the servant, the bond servant in some of your translations. I'm the bond servant, the bond servant of the who? The Lord. These words that we're talking about today, she's saying them. I'm the bond servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And if you look at the verb tense, let it be to me or let it be done to me. That's in the passive verb tense. These are critical things to understand. Passive. Let it be done to me, Lord. I'm going to sit here, stand here as an empty vessel. You do to me. You do to my womb, my uterus. You do to my body, my soul. You do to me according to your word. I am passive. I am sitting here confessing you as my Lord. Yahweh, and I am your slave. And whatever you do to me, let it be done. Let it be done to me. Most of us look at that response. Oh, that's cute. That's kind of nice. Wow. That's... When you look at this response deeply of what it means, this little girl teenager, barely a teenager, spoke what was in her heart. And she said, I am your bondservant, Lord. I'm a bondservant of the Lord. And she gave everything to Jesus. Everything, everything physically, her whole body her whole mind, her heart, her soul. She gave it to the Lord of the universe. Jesus is the absolute Lord of all. And will we respond like Mary? And if we do respond like Mary, what do we do next? What do we do what do we do after we respond like Mary? Very simple, two words, love and obey. There's no other way. Love and obey. The first word, love, is what we're going to look at. And Jesus speaks about this in John. He speaks about this. He gives us this so clearly. He tells us in his own words what we are to do. John 13, 34. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you to love one another. You've heard this over and over. Just as I have loved you, key. Just as I, this is important. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Get that. The way I love people in the way Jesus loves people, okay? The way I've loved you, love other people. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. You will see that you're my disciples if what? If you have love for one another. So Jesus is saying right now, if you're my disciple, if you claim to love me, how do you prove it? How does, how does the world know? You love other people. Now just... 
gave you a truth, a true confession. I don't love like Jesus loves. The love of Jesus forgives 70 times 7. And that's just a word picture. He means indefinitely. He doesn't mean literally just 70 times 7, 490 times. Those are the perfect numbers. He wants you to forgive eternally. Every time someone sins against you, you forgive them. I don't do that all the time. I don't. Jesus loves, turns the other cheek. And you know I don't do that. I've already confessed. I don't have time to go through all my sins. But I've given you a perfect example when someone was being rude to me and I fought back. Horrible. Jesus loves, walks the extra mile. And if he has to take his shirt, he gives you his shirt and his coat. I don't do that all the time. Jesus' love reaches out to the sick, the poor, the untouchables like the lepers. I do that some. Had to do that professionally. And I still do that for the most part, but not always. Because there's sometimes people that are repugnant and I just turn away. Jesus' love looks for the good in all people. And I have a struggle with that. I'll just be honest. I see behavior. I see things that are very off-putting. And I don't see, hey, Jesus died for that person. I see their negative behavior. And I'm turned off. Jesus said, and that's why I love God's word. Jesus says, love the way I have loved you. Love others by do, loving the way I have loved you. And I can't do that. But Jesus can through me, through the power of His Holy Spirit. I can't do that. I walk away sometimes from people that are really smelly and dirty. I walk away sometimes from people who are living a lifestyle that just totally upsets me. I walk away sometimes, even to loved ones, when I get angry. Jesus tells us to love the way he has loved us, and this is how you know if you're my disciple. Jesus is the absolute Lord of all. And his first commandment to us is to love, to love the way he has loved us. And I pray we can do that. The second, obey, love and obey, love and obey. This is pretty simple stuff, except when it comes down to doing it. Makes sense, but boy, in practice, we struggle, don't we? Even with this one, obeying, we struggle with and we're going to look at John 8, 31. And then one other verse. Hang with me. John 8, 31. <clears throat> if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. Here's Jesus telling us. How do you know you're my disciple? Loving. And look at this. You're abiding in my word. We'll get to that in a second. In John 14, 15 where he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So love and obey. Here's obeying. The word abide means to continue in or remain close to the word of God. Continue in and remain close to the word of God. You are abiding the word of God in the word of God. And that's why over and over and over I emphasize the number one most important personal spiritual discipline is the intake of God's Word. Being in His Word. Prayer goes right with that. But being in His Word, Jesus tells us 
You know you're my disciple. If you love me, abide, remain in my word. Because when you remain in my word, you will learn about truth, absolute truth. And he will set you free. Keeping commandments, the word keep, means to persist in obedience, to be consistent. And we don't keep commandments because we're earning our way into heaven. A lot of people argue this. Oh, you just do this because you're, you're going, you got to get that, do that to get into heaven. No, 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 no. Don't you understand love first, then obey? When you are so in love, with Jesus, you're going to follow what he teaches you to do in his word. You're going to follow what he calls you to do when he calls you into a place you don't really want to go. You're going to follow. You're going to trust him just like Mary did. Here's my life, Lord. Every part of my body, have it. It's yours. And we're going to say that because we love him. We are not earning anything. We love him. And we want to persist in obedience, following him, obeying him. And only through the power of the Holy Spirit can we do this. I can't do it on my own. You know me. I'm the chief of sinners. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, he can help me. Because don't you see <clears throat> that I sometimes struggle even, we all struggle keeping in God's Word. Now, I'm in God's Word a lot because now it's my job, right? But that's not all. I mean, I, I still have quiet times. I still try to persist, but things will throw me off track. How many of you here, how many love to have quiet times, but all mm, oh, the kids are here, the grandkids are here, hmm, can't do it. Oh, we're on vacation. Oops, I forgot my Bible. No, my Bible's in, in, the, in, the, in the suitcase, but I still don't get into God's Word every day sometimes. There are so many other things that happen in our lives that this book and His Word gets shoved aside sometimes, doesn't it? We have to have a discipline through the power of the Holy Spirit to be in His Word daily. Continuing, abiding, remaining in his word. And he will show us the way. As I close, one of the <clears throat> favorite Christmas carols of my wife, I told her I wasn't going to talk about her today. I'm not really talking about her. Well, I am a little. Is Mary, did you know? She wants that at her funeral, okay? Seriously, I am talking about you. Sorry, Kathy. Mary, did you know Kenny Rogers? And I think there's a judge lady, one of the judges that sings with him on that song. And here's, <clears throat> and it is a good song. I mean, she gets teary-eyed every time she hears it. it. Does and it spills over to me some. So at the end of the song, Mary, did you know? That sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. You know that line. That's near the end. The sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. If you write that word in Greek, it's going to be capital L-O-R-D. The sleeping child Mary's holding is Yahweh, is the great I am. He's the Lord, the Lord of the universe. And even as a baby in Colossians 1, 17, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. If Jesus ever quit being God, the world would fall apart. In that beautiful verse in, in the first chapter of Colossians. So even as a baby, even in a uterus, he is God. 
And it's that miraculous 100% God, 100% human incarnation, we call it. He is holding the world together because he is the Lord of all, even as a baby. And we can't understand. Don't need to understand. That's the truth. He is the great I am. Love him. Love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Love him. And then through the power of his Holy Spirit, obey him. Love and obey. There's no other way to have this relationship. And will you join me as I commit? Will you join me in following Mary's example? Will you say with me, Behold, I am, we are, the bond servants of the Lord. The Lord. May it be done to me. May it be done to you. May it be done to us. Father God. May it be done to us according to your word. Will you commit that with me today? Pray with me. 